The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 676 for Sunday, September 24th, 2017. Yeah, greetings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show. Where uh, the goal is for each and every one of us to learn at least four new things. And we do that by answering your questions, sharing your tips, sharing cool stuff found, and generally just kind of discussing these things that facilitate learning new things. And that's how it works. Sponsors for this episode include Stamps.com, a new sponsor for us here where... I've got a way for you to go get uh, a four week free trial, including some postage and a digital scale. So we'll talk more about that a little bit later here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut. John F. Braun. How you doing, Mr. John F. Braun? We're doing good, man. Good. How are you? Any and any anything uh, anything happening today? Uh, nothing that I know of. I don't. I don't. What are you driving at, my friend? Oh, uh, you know, any life status event that? Ah, uh, yes, I am a day older than I was yesterday. <laughs> but you're also a year older. I, so everybody wish Dave Hamilton a big happy birthday. Thanks, man. Congratulations on making it this far. That's the idea. Yes, that's the idea. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, I could think of no better way to start my birthday than to spend it uh, with everybody here. This is this is a fun thing that we get to do. So. This is your first present of the day. Uh, actually, my family woke up with me this morning and, and gave me some gifts. But this is, you know, this is my gift to myself is really yes. what uh, what that what that is. Yes. 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 All right. Let's. Uh, so let's do this thing. Let's start with some tips because I learned something prepping these tips, as I always do. Um, and we'll start with one that appeared on Facebook in our group there from Scott who says, did you know that search under iOS can do conversions? I was trying to figure out the cost for shipping a 50 kilogram item when prices are quoted in pounds. I entered 50 kilograms in pounds in the search field, and it showed me the result. Of course, you can also ask Siri this if you want to do it verbally. So pretty cool. I, you know... We know these things. Sometimes we can intuit that it probably would do these things. And of course, that's true on Mac OS as well. You can do uh, conversions there. And we talked about that actually recently on Mac OS, but, uh, but it's right there in iOS as well. That's, and I, I love stuff like that. It makes it fun. Makes it. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. It's handy. I wish we'd get with the program with the rest of the world and use the metric system, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. So oh, no, 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 need no. Conversions. Dude, we're, we're entrenched. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. We need conversions anyway. It's always, you know, it's always good. Uh, also on Facebook, listener Jim brings us, he says, I upgraded to iOS 11 on both my iPhone 7 Plus and my iPad Pro 9.7, and everything seems to be okay except for one thing. The files application doesn't appear on my iPad screen. It's still launchable by search and it appears in the new dock when launched, but it's nowhere to be found on the home screens. I think I'll try another reboot. And he said the reboot didn't help, but what did is taking it from uh, the dock in iOS and just dragging it back to the home screen, which will relocate something on the home screen. So it either was there in somewhere he couldn't find, or we've seen this where apps just sometimes aren't there. But with the uh, with the new dock on the iPad, he was able to <laughs> to to find it and move it. So there you go. I love stuff like that. I mean, I you know it's it's quirky and all that, but have I you find met? I, <laughs> I find I sometimes lose apps and that I'll fumble finger, you know, yeah, in the moving mode, and then I'm like. Where, where did I put it? Where, yeah, where Sometimes put it? everything yeah. jumps around in like a really <laughs> yeah, annoying totally. fashion. And I put something where I didn't intend to. So yep. I'm sorry. Did you have a question? No, I was going to say, have you tried the files app? Uh, you know, I just noticed it. So now that it's been mentioned here, I don't think I've 
noticed it on my iPad, but I, I noticed it on my iPhone and I'm yeah. like, oh, that's, yeah, they talked about that. So yeah, I'm yeah. like, okay, let me, uh, let me launch it. And it's like, hey, here's all these third party services that do cloud stuff that you can talk to. And I'm like, oh, well, that's nice. Let's, uh, yeah. you know, let's create some uh, connections here. So uh, I, used to I have think it's that. pretty cool. Oh yeah, it it's great. And and there's even an on my iPhone section for those of you that that haven't dug in. Right, you can if you launch the Files app in the upper right corner is the Edit uh, button, which is probably the first thing you're going to want to do as as somebody who's you know anybody listening to this show, you know where we like to tweak things and get them set just right. So by hitting that Edit button, you can go through and choose which of your cloud services are going to appear in you know the the files app and like all of my even kind of what i would consider the weird third party stuff i mean of course the the synology stuff shows up there transmit shows up dropbox of course um icloud drive obviously and then even things like hubic uh which is a backup service that i've been using i think you get i don't know you get like 10 gigs free or 15 gigs free or something maybe 20 no you get 25 gigs free with with the uh, synology so where's where's on my uh, so it, I go and like, I launch the files app. I'm in the browse, uh, yeah. s- section. I go to the upper right. I hit edit and yeah, on I'm my, there. on my iPhone is one of my options. Under locations. Correct. Uh, I don't see that. I'll so out why. I have, well, let's, I mean, my speculation would be that I have some, I have something in the, I, the, on my iPhone location. It's actually some files from an app called Capo which is a cool little app that lets you like it, it analyzes song. It's for learning songs, but it, it, um, it analyzes them and then uh, will put what it figures are like beat markers and also chords. It like, it figures out what, what the chords are. And then, and, and that's like super handy. Cause if you want to play along with it or learn it, like there's the chords. And I mean, it's, it's intuiting them from the, or not intuiting. It's, it's sorting them out. So they might not be exactly right, but they're pretty close. And, uh, but the, the coolest part for me is you can then take a song and slow it down without detuning it. And it's a great way to start to learn like grooves and riffs and stuff like that. Cause you can play along with it and loop it and all that stuff. So yeah, capo, if, if you're a musician of any kind, I use it to learn drum parts, right. Um, you know, in addition to anything else, but Capo has stored some things locally on my phone. So that may be why that location shows up. Otherwise, Apple says, yeah. if you don't, if you don't have, maybe, you know, if you don't have anything there, we don't want you like trying to store stuff here. Like that's not their decision to make. Correct. I'm going to I'm gonna figure out how to. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. But yeah, I see, a, I see iCloud Drive, Google Drive, DS Cloud, DS File, OneDrive, SanDisk Connect. That's cool. The, the little memory stick they make and Dropbox. So that's what I got now. Cool. Yeah. 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 It's fun stuff. So, and, um, you know, while we're, while we're at it, uh, I, I want to kind of jump to a, a question that we had, cause it's very much related to what we're talking about here or how, uh, Jim got to the files app. And that's Jed who says on iOS 10 and before I never launched apps by going to the app icons. I just used search. And so, and I'm the same way. Uh, he just pulls down, t- you know, to pull up the, the spotlight search, starts typing the name of an app. When it appears, you hit launch. He said, but now apps don't seem to come up as reliably. He says, in order to get an app to launch, I have to type its entire name. So to say to launch Dropbox, instead of typing DROP and seeing all the apps that might have that in their file name he needs to type all of it like even d-r-o-p-b-o doesn't show the app when he hits x the app appears and uh and the, the reason for that is settings that were inherited from what you had in ios 10 in ios 10 all apps were always searchable by their name a hundred percent of the time I mean, unless there was a problem but there was no way you could tell it don't find this app but you could go in to the Siri and search preferences in iOS 10 and turn off the app there, which would stop it from having its contents appear and be indexed. Well, it would, I think they'd still be indexed, but the contents wouldn't appear 
in the results list. Now in iOS 11, those two settings are combined. So if you have turned off Siri and search for an app, it won't launch unless you type or it won't show up to be launched unless you type the full app name. It's a pain in the neck. And the worst part is the user interface for turning this on in bulk is not fun. But if you go into settings on your iPhone, go into Siri and search, uh, it will bring up a list of all of your apps and you can see which ones do and don't have this turned on because underneath the app's name, it will say Siri and search suggestions if it's turned on. And if it's not, it'll just say off and you have to go to each one and turn it on and then back out and then go to the next one and turn it on and back out. And so I'm slowly going through all my apps to, uh, to re-enable this. It's a pain in the neck, but uh, the good news is I haven't found it slowing down my phone. The reason I had turned all that stuff off was I found it slowing down my search results in iOS 10 and having it mostly now all on. Um, it's not so bad. So there you go. That's what we do. That's how we do it. Don't you think, John? Usually. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. I, along the concept of searching, uh, I believe a different Scott on Facebook says, perhaps this has existed in prior versions of iOS too. He says, but I noticed that certainly in iOS 10 and 11, I can search for keywords that were tagged in the Mac version of photos. I said, that's pretty cool. I didn't realize you could do that. Uh, he says, I wish I could actually add and edit keywords from the iPhone, but alas, no. And, uh, and iOS 11 doesn't add that that functionality either but uh but being able to search for the keywords that you have set elsewhere i.e on your mac yeah there you go so pretty good right john indeed all right um you want to uh, well I, I can you want to take us to joe i can take us to joe okay <clears throat> so joe tweeted tweeted and facebook this but um it's an interesting point to make, uh, and that you can still use uh, iTunes to do uh, management of things. Well, let me let me catch people up so that they're they're so that they understand what you're saying. Uh, in the last show in six seventy five, we said that iMazing was the only way for loading iOS apps back onto your iPhone uh, and iPad from your Mac. Now that iTunes twelve point seven uh, has changed that that UI. And Joe says he owns iMazing and it's great. But as John started saying, you can still transfer iOS apps to your iOS devices with just iTunes. You don't need to buy iMazing. So I'll let you walk people through how that's done. And, you know, I don't exactly see it in this article for apps. I see it for other content. And the, 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 the article that Apple published shortly after they changed things because they knew there'd be a uproar was um, one of these, these uh, articles is manually manage content on your iPhone, iPad or iPod touch using iTunes. Right. When so I'm the way through the article, I don't see how it, uh, I don't see anything specifically for apps though. I see it for several other types of content. Right. So what you do is you connect your phone and you go to uh in, you're in the devices tab, right? Uh, on the or sorry, in the in the devices section. So you have to have the sidebar up in iTunes. It's it's a little wonky, but they explain this in the uh, in the, the 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 section on the on the bottom of of uh, of the article that you talked about. Uh, you can drag things in once you have the iTunes sidebar up, which is going to be up when you're in the music section of iTunes and have the library tab or section selected uh, you can drag things from the finder into that sidebar right onto your device and it will put them on there so that's how that's done yeah yeah it's pretty good it's pretty good Alrighty. yeah man yeah yeah uh you want to take us to uh to john from twitter yeah john brought up a good one here so in iTunes, there's no longer an apps 
uh, when you click on your device, there's a lot of categories of things that you can see on your device, but one of them that is no longer available, as we all know, or if you don't, try it. <laughs> Apps isn't there anymore. Right. Wouldn't it be great if Apple made another app that would let you see the apps on your device? And they do, Dave. One of they the things do? that... Uh, yes, well, at least they haven't taken away the ability yet. Let's, uh, let's hope they don't listen to this. But uh, Apple Configurator 2. Oh, yeah. Which lets you do all sorts of uh, uh, setting up profiles and, and configurations and managing. Uh, enterprise users use it, but uh, regular Mac users, like we, or is that us? Like us. Like us, yeah. Um, can also run Apple Configurator 2. And you will notice that if you run it and you plug in your device, you will see an apps category in the sidebar and you click on it and it shows all the apps that are on the device. So you have not lost this ability with a Mac OS app. Huh? Yeah. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Huh. All so right. it begs many questions. Like why did they leave it there, but take it out of iTunes? And uh, I, I think well, we'll never know. No, I mean, I, I like, here's the thing that actually makes sense to me. I, I mean, Apple Configurator 2 isn't an obvious place to go and look, right? Yet. But but taking it out of iTunes and cleaning iTunes up and paring it down, like they need to get all of the syncing and management of your devices out of iTunes, right? And, and they're doing that, you know, uh, with with much, uh, you know, hand wringing from the public. But uh, but it it should be in there should be some app that lets you do this. Right. And so maybe Apple configurator is the key there that maybe, you know, this is the thing that get, lets you get there. And, and I don't know, maybe that that's not such a bad thing. I went and this was actually really handy. I, I you know, I collect man, I right there? too much singing have last it, night. Have some water. I, I, you, you have, you would be shocked at the quantity of water that I've been drinking this morning. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> singing and sweating for a, a, a wedding I played last night. Anyway, I knew I wanted to delete like a hundred apps off my iPhone and I started, you know, the painstaking one by one process. And then I thought, now nah, there's a bit, there's gotta be a better way. Let me see if I amazing will do it. So I connected my phone. Actually, I didn't even have to connect my phone cause I had already done it. And so it was wirelessly connected and I just went to my phone and I brought up my list of apps and I highlighted one and I deleted it. I was like, yeah. And I looked on my phone and it's gone. It's like, oh, sweet. Great. And then I command clicked through a ton of apps and, you know, selected like a hundred and I hit delete. Boom. Gone right away. Good to go. So I was pretty happy about that. So, All right. yeah. 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 Uh, another little tip uh, on iMazing, since it seems like that's become everybody's favorite app for uh, for this stuff, certainly ours. Brett reminds us, uh, he says, I'm sure you already know this, but if you're running iMazing Mini, uh, from the menu bar, select the iMazing icon to bring up the drop down and then click on the battery icon for any of your devices. It will give you detailed battery health status for that device. And I think you've mentioned this in passing a couple of times, John, but I wanted to I wanted to highlight it because it's I didn't. Oh, well, right. I mentioned a, a bigger deal. And that there's also a little, uh, you, you'll see near your device, a little circle with an eye in it, which means info to everybody. Um, that lists every piece of information about your iOS device that it can possibly glean through the means that Apple makes available, including that battery info, but it's buried in there. So this is certainly handy if that's all you need to know. Right. Yeah. Cool. Cool, cool. Uh, you want to, you want to wrap up the tip section with the one from Dr. Bob on Twitter too? Dr. Bob. So I saw a friend, Dr. Bob on the Twitters and he asked for some support from Apple because Apple has a support account on. Yeah. If you don't follow that account or if you, I mean, you don't have to follow it to use it, but yeah. At Apple support is a good, uh, is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. And his question to them was, well, dude, how do I manage my tones and stuff now? Yeah. Yeah. And their answer was read this article. <laughs> RTFM, Bob. 
<laughs> and it's called Use Tones on your iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch. And it tells you how you can change your ringtone, re-download previously purchased, or move ringtones from iTunes to your device. So there you go. And it was written right around the time that they released the new iTunes. Of course. Because they knew people were going to ask this question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is, I mean, this is interesting. Everybody, it's funny, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll keep this brief because we've actually got tech tips and stuff to go through. But for so long, many of us, myself included, have been, you know, ranting and shaking our fists as we do about iTunes has too much stuff in it, you know, too much functionality. You got to clean it up. You got to clean it up. Finally, Apple does something significant to, you know, to clean some what uh, what they considered cruft out of iTunes. And instantly, you know, everybody's fists are shaking in the air. Why did you take that away from me? You're terrible. You know, it's like, ah, I can't win for losing. But um, but there are ways of managing this stuff. They're just cleaning it up. So hopefully, hopefully, I think they are well aware of all of the things that, uh, that we find frustrating about iTunes. And I think separating out iOS device management from it, once they can successfully do that and not, you know, hurt their, their business, I think that's going to be a really good thing. So I think they're moving. And I think, I think the they've got some this vision up, that we're not quite seeing yet. But the way to sum this up, Dave, and I've heard this phrase used in multiple contexts, but they did just what I asked for, but not what I want. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We programmers are all too used to exactly that happening. Like, oh, that's what I told it to do. That's what I wrote, but it's not what I wanted. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, man. Hey, I want to, uh, I want to take a minute here and talk about our new sponsor stamps.com. Uh, you know, these days, you can get practically everything that you want on demand, right? I mean, you can listen to this podcast whenever you want, when it's convenient for you. Sometimes you want to do stuff when it's not convenient to go to the post office, right? You want to, you know, get some postage. You want to get everything ready for a package or whatever. Well, stamps.com is the answer because you can do Anything that you can do at the post office, you can do right from your desk with stamps.com, right? You can buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter package using your own computer and printer. Yesterday, uh, yesterday, Friday, I, uh, I had, you know, we at Backbeat Media, we have our, our publishers that we pay and most of them we pay with direct deposit, but we still pay a few with, with checks. And so we printed the checks and, uh, and I went to grab, you know, window envelopes like we normally do. And I realized, oh, that's right. We're out of stamps. I'm like, crap, I don't have time. I bet I, I don't want to hold off on paying these people. Like that's that's one of the things in business, man. Like I think if, if somebody deserves to be paid, you need to pay them right away. Like I don't want to lag on this, but I really don't have time. And then I remembered, duh, you've got a stamps.com thing. Good to go. They're your sponsor on Sunday. Great. So I went online. And uh, logged into our account and we had some postage there. And it, the nice part is, you know, you, like, like, like I said, you can buy anything you want. So I said, I'm printing a letter and it said, put it on the scale. I'm like, well, I know it's just a letter. I know it just needs a single stamp, but let's use the scale. So I put the stuff on the scale and it automatic, it connects USB to the computer and it weighed it and auto filled on the website. It was actually really cool how that all worked. And then, uh, it said, OK, you know, and I hit print and it, I printed just a regular envelope and it puts the postage on. I folded up the check and put it in there and I put it out at the mailbox and whoosh, away it went just like it's supposed to. So really, really cool, really convenient, 24 seven. Like this was the first time I used it and it took no time at all. Really, really worked well. And so you can do this, too. You get a four week free trial or four week trial, and that includes postage and a digital scale. So a four week trial, stamps.com includes postage and a digital scale. And the way you get that is you go to stamps.com and then before you do anything else, and this is the important part, because otherwise you're not going to get the special deal, uh, 
click on the little radio microphone that's at the top of the homepage and then click MGG. So go to stamps.com. I can speak. I, I swear I can speak. Go to stamps.com. Go up. Click the radio microphone at the top of the homepage and type in MGG. You can do it all right there. So awesome. Makes it so easy. I, we're, we will always be using stamps.com here at, uh, at Backbeat Media and Mac Observer and Mac Geek Up going forward. It's, um, it's awesome. So our thanks to stamps.com for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Uh, that's pretty cool stuff, though. I got to say, I love it when, like, you know, the sponsor stuff becomes the cool stuff oh, yeah. found. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. All right. Uh, iCloud. I, I swear both these questions that <sighs> we're, we're about to do are the same in terms of the what I what I hope we're, we're teaching here. So uh, listener Mike writes, he says. My searches, oh, uh, my contacts on my MacBook, uh, he says, originally running Snow Leopard, upgraded a year ago to Sierra, and on my iPhone, I, running uh, at this point in time, it was iOS 10 when he, when he sent this in, the latest, aren't synced. He says, uh, I think they used to sync themselves. I suspect that broke with my Sierra upgrade a year ago, and I haven't been able to get it back in sync. So we assume at that point means he's rebooted the computer and the iPhone since this happened. Cause that's always a good way to kind of re kickstart uh, iCloud syncing. And you're right, Mike, they should be in sync. Uh, sometimes on your Mac, you can use the console to get some further details on this, but, but um, the, often the easiest path to resolution is to log out of iCloud on the troublesome device and log back in that will very often jumpstart things. Cause I think it cleans out some caches and it, it kind of forces it to rethink that process. And, but here's, here's the thing, right? I, I know what I just said, log out of iCloud on the troublesome device. And you might be saying, but Dave, I don't know which one is being troublesome. I make changes on either one and they don't sync, but I don't know which one is the problem. And I, I know it's true, but you can find out. And the way you find out is log in to iCloud.com. We have visibility from iCloud.com into what Apple sees on their servers for our accounts, right? So go to iCloud.com, go to your contacts in this case, and take a look, right? Make a change on each device or something that you know is inconsistent between the two, and see which one iCloud.com agrees with. Whichever one that is, that's likely the one that's not being troublesome. So log the other one out and log it back in. And that should do it. But being able to see that stuff on iCloud.com versus what we couldn't do with, you know, dot max sync, where it was just a, you know, black hole most of the time and all that stuff. Um, or at least originally it was. It's really handy. And don't forget to use iCloud.com in your troubleshooting. It will get you... It will get you answers that are often helpful. As Brian Monroe in our chat room at MacGeekGab.com slash stream says, the truth is in the cloud. That is, I like that, man. It's so true. Uh, and, you know, no, no reference intended. But, uh, but yeah, the truth is in the cloud. I like it. I like it. Yeah. What do you think about this, John? What I think is, why did, the, what? So I was lamenting the uh, state of iCloud sinkiness that people may be experiencing. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to tell, like in this case, and that we were sent two screenshots, and one had certain things on it, and one had was missing one of them. And it's like, all right, well, that's that's a, a start to how to debug it. Of course, you gave the ultimate way to debug it because what's in the cloud is should be the authority. Well, it, I just it noticed Dave, tells you which one is syncing with the cloud. And the cool part is you can make changes in the cloud too and see if those changes sync down to your device. So you can really kind of test this at all ways. It, 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 it makes life easier. Yeah. Not, unfortunately yeah. you can't see everything that's in the cloud, but, um, but a lot of things you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the thing I just noticed though is, so I, you know, 
tried to uh, run contacts on my iOS 11 upgraded iPhone 7, mm -hmm. and I just got a notification saying contacts are no longer updated by Facebook. That's a surprise. Oh, that's right. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we talked about this when it first came out. Yeah, Facebook, like that whole link between Facebook and Twitter and iOS that was happening at the system level is gone. And I think even like the Twitter app, maybe it's seen an update since, but it was complaining to, oh, it, was, it wasn't the Twitter app. I went to use, like I was in Safari or something and hit the share sheet to uh, to to tweet you know, to share something on, on, uh, on Twitter. And, uh, and it originally came up, it's been fixed now with the update, but it was like, yeah, we have no Twitter accounts to defined in iOS. So I got nothing for you. So, but they've fixed that now. Just make sure to update all your apps it's at like super important now more than ever. Uh, be, just because of, you know, iOS 11. So stay on top of those updates, especially for you should just stay on top of updates in general. I know sometimes an update will break something, but uh, more often than not, like way more often than not, updating the apps is a good thing. And especially so right now that there's been this OS update. So that's that's my yeah, advice. I only had like eight casualties that uh, the developer chose not to make a 64 bit upgrade. So, yeah, but none of them are critical. That's good. Yeah, I had there was one critical app that I was worried about because it was an app that allows me to control one of the mixers that I use and one of the bands that I'm in. And it was only 32 bit. And it was like, oh, crap, I hope this company like stays up to date with this. And because the app hadn't been updated in like a year and a half, it's like, oh, no. And then right before iOS 11 was officially released, they pushed an update out and they're like, yeah, it just adds 64 bit support. It's like, oh, whew. so. But I always leave my my mission critical. Like I have an iPad that I just use on stage, and that iPad uh, will probably stay on ten three three for a little bit longer. I think. Yeah, but I, I guess you know. they had to do it in the interest of performance and battery life. And oh, totally. Yeah. No, it's you know. it's the right thing. Yeah, it makes life easier. It's been deprecated for a while. People had time to catch up. So. All right. The uh, the next question, I promised that they were related, and uh, I, I think you'll see that they are. At least you'll see how I uh, how I'm looking at it. Evelyn on Facebook asks, I'm wondering if anyone else has this issue. Every time I have taken pictures on my iPhone, it takes forever for them to upload to my Mac. Is it just because I have over 19,000 pictures? Uh, so. What we're talking about here is iCloud photo library. And, and again, it's, it's important to kind of step back and think about the process. They are not uploading directly to your Mac. They are going from your phone to the cloud and then from the cloud back down to your Mac. Sometimes, uh, and I've actually seen this, I, I think I was telling you in pre-show today, John, I've had this week alone, four people call me with this issue. So, what I've been seeing is that the photos upload to the cloud just fine. And again, how do we test that? Well, we go to iCloud and we look at our photos. If you're using iCloud Photo Library, you will see them there. If you're just using PhotoStream, you won't see them there. There's no visibility into PhotoStream from iCloud.com as far as I know. So if it's just PhotoStream, sorry, you're going to have to test from another device to see if those photos are making it to photo stream and not your Mac. And that way you can narrow down where the device is. But I've seen it on my Mac and several others this week where photos just don't sync down from the cloud to the Mac. Rebooting the Mac often solves this problem. But if you want to solve it yourself, generally what it is, is the syncing processes that sit in the background get hung uh, and the way to fix it is quit photos to get that out of the way. And then I go quit three other things in activity monitor. And I have to do force quit it, it usually at least on one of them. And that is photos space agent photo library D and photo analysis D. And we'll put a link to the Facebook post where, where this all exists. Um, but, uh, but those, those three, I just, I go into activity monitor and it, what's cool in activity monitors, you can, filter what you see. So I fill, I just put in the word photo 
And then that way it's, you know, it narrows down the results and I can just see the processes that have the word photo in them somewhere. And then I just go, I kill those off and, and, uh, and then relaunch photos and boom, instantly everything just starts pouring in. So hopefully that helps. But John, you have some thoughts for if it's not the Mac, if it's the iPhone <clears throat> that's causing the problems. Right? I do. Well, you were telling me about them in pre-show, so I thought maybe you'd ah, share I those see. again here. Um, oh, you mean the whole deal about, um, okay, them getting from the device up into Correct. the cloud. Correct, from getting from the phone to the cloud. Yes, exactly. I have noticed that we, 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 they may even still have this article, but so I'll dig around for it. Uh, but they said that there are certain conditions that under which the photos will not make it into the cloud. And I think what they said is, number one, don't be running the camera app. And I don't know if that's still true. Maybe they fixed that in iOS 11. Oh, interesting. So they don't sync until you leave the camera app? That's what I found at one point. That, that would kind of like, make sense because at least there you can start deleting. You know, you can take a picture and say, oh, no, I don't want that. Delete it. And it's not wasting its time. But I think if it's in the for maybe it's in the background, then it'll be like, oh, OK, well. No, yeah, and, sure. And, uh, yeah. and of course, you got to be on. Uh, you got to have a decent Wi-Fi wi connection. I don't think that stuff's typically going to go over your data plan uh, or you don't want it to. Well, no, you might want it to. Yeah, um, maybe you do. If, if you go, there's a couple places to set it, but. Uh, if you go on iOS 11 into settings photos, you can turn a lot of these things on and off and cellular data is one of those options. And, uh, and you can, you can turn on or off using cellular data for updating your library by default. It's on. Um, and you can, and then there's an, another option in there and I actually don't know what this is for. It says unlimited updates. And I'm not sure what that means, but uh, the help text underneath it says unlimited updates may cause you to exceed your quota. Now, I don't know what that means, but there you go. So if you've got an unlimited plan, maybe that's what this is for. Oh, mm. but I, that one was off by default for me, by the way. But cellular data is on. So and I definitely uh, I actually disagree with you on that. I definitely want my phone to sync photos new photos up to iCloud with cellular data I mean that's like the whole point of it I want those things backed up immediately I don't want to wait until I'm on you know some Wi-Fi network later or whatever I took the picture I want it backed up that's what to me that's what iCloud photo library is for but there you go I mean it, you can turn it off if you don't okay. like, if you don't like <clears throat> it yeah in my case that's what I, the I'm data wary. Is for. I'm just wary because I had my data plan mysteriously balloon almost to its limit, and I had no idea what app was responsible for it. And also, I, I only have two gigs data a month. Where I'm, I'm sure you have much more than that. We, what I sort do. Of family plan, or do you have? I, I don't know if you have unlimited or I no. guess they deprecated those. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, then they have an unlimited plan again uh, that we've thought about going to. We're we're with AT and T. And we have the 15 gig plan. It's shared amongst six of us, the four of us in my house and, and then my dad and, um, and his wife. So we're all family members, but um, which makes it great for Apple music, but, and also for this data, but that 15 gigs is, is right for us. It's about, uh, you know, generally in a month, we as a family use about 12 and there's at least one person in my house that, could care less about limits. Uh, my daughter is a data holic. She'll, she'll stand up in front of the room and say, hi, my name's Skylar. I'm a data holic. And uh, she just can't help herself. She, you know, she knows she's like, Oh yeah, it's, it's a problem. I'd love to watch like food videos and things like that. And I'll do it over cellular because I can't not. And, uh, and so she uses about six gigs a month, somewhere between four and six. Um, I'm usually about two. Sometimes I go over if I'm traveling, but, um, but it, you know, the 15 gig plan works, uh, unlimited would be nice just cause we wouldn't have to think about it, but it would, it would probably cost us an extra 50 bucks a month to move to that just cause we're on an older plan that we've got some discounts baked into it that wouldn't follow forward. So, um, every time I look, it's like, you know, if you could do this for like the same price or five or 10 bucks more, I'd jump to it, but 
Yeah, 50 bucks. We just, we, we never go over because we got rollover data. So we can, when we do go over, we're, you know, borrowing from what we didn't use last month. So, so there you go. That answers your question. Right? All right. All right. Um, you want to take us to Ralph, my friend? <sighs> Ralph had a question. He did. Let me get that question up here. There it is. Oh, come on. Stop <laughs> figuring out my screens here. Oh, I, ha right. I have a solution for you. But we'll get to that question. But I, but I have a solution for you. So. Yep. Yeah. But anyways, um, David John, quick question regarding your discussion with OAuth. If I utilize a Google or Facebook login for a website, and that brings me to a page that says the website is only requesting my name and email address, dot, dot, dot. Then I authorize that website to use the OAuth token. What happens if they change the requirements and now want other information from my Facebook account, like friends or my birthday? If I already authorized them previously, can they request new information that I originally authorized? Uh, more information than I originally authorized. Just trying to make sure I don't get caught, which is a honorable goal. Oh, that's that's honorable. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and here's the answer. So one thing I tossed in the show notes for the last show, um, we had some, uh, was the uh, programmer's guides for the, the various services. Uh, Facebook, uh, they're typically called login or sign in. So Facebook login, Twitter sign in, Google sign in, whatever. And they all have a number of aspects to them. One is, you know, providing authentication and the other is asking, well, what do you want to share? Yeah. Is that okay? And, and just for clarity, because we got some notes where we're, we're you know, we're talking about this thing that we call OAuth and and not spelling it. So it we we didn't explain the genesis of the term. It's O A U T H or short for open authentication. So it's a system, and this is what we described last week, where you authenticate with one service and then that service vouches for you effectively elsewhere so that other people don't have to build login systems. You can just use that one. So there you go. And the good news, Dave, is that if you dig into the document, which I painstakingly tore through every page, <laughs> not really. Yeah. So I went into the web section, and then they have a permission section, and they explicitly say in that, when you ask for new permissions, the person using your app will be asked about those new permissions and has the ability to opt out. So... I appreciate the sneaky thinking because yeah, what if an evil developer wants to all of a sudden get access to all sorts of additional things? And right. maybe this was a security thing in the past. I don't know, but uh, it's certainly not the case now. Right. Right. Yep. So yep, don't sweat sure. it. Don't sweat it. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, and then we had, we had one other thing in, uh, on, on Facebook where, uh, listener Michael was saying, if my credentials service, uh, cre or if my credentials for the service that I'm using, like Facebook in this case, are leaked uh, or lost, will that allow an attacker to access even more accounts? Presumably they would see what OAuth tokens are there and then could go to those sites and log in. And uh, yeah, that's true uh, for sure. So yeah, if you're using Facebook or Google, any of these as your kind of as, as your single sign on to the web, if you will. Uh, and yeah, you really need to protect that pretty diligently with a good password, probably two factor authentication, which most of them now support. Uh, in fact, I, I wouldn't do the whole point in my opinion of doing OAuth is that you're choosing to say, Hey, I'm going to trust this service to keep my authentication credentials secure. And therefore I don't have to worry about whether or not that service and that service and that service keep their systems up to date because I'm just going to use this one. But if you're going to do that, you have to sort of, you have to meet them halfway and take advantage of all of the security that they have. So don't use, you know, a four digit password that's easily guessable. One, 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 one is bad. You know, one, two, three, four is worse. Uh, but, um, but, you know, also use two factor authentication and really lock that down so that um, so that you're there. The nice part about it is generally once you've logged in on your, you know, on one device, 
it, 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 it likes you. And so you don't have to go through all the pains of the two factor every day and all that stuff. So it can be helpful, but, but meet them halfway. Yes. Right, John. I'll meet them. You, you, did you meet them? Yeah. Hey, uh, so I, um, I, uh, I, I want to jump around a little bit because listener Joe has a question that, uh, that I think might help you, John. And, uh, and that is, he said, I have a widescreen and vertical dual monitor set up at work. He says, I'm a doctor in this use case. So I need various sources of info open at the same time. Uh, he says, I need to see all kinds of things at basically at once to, uh, to deal with our, our, you know, healthcare IT and all the systems I need to log into. So he has to have his agencies, his, his uh, practice agencies thing open. He needs to have the state's web portal open. He has to access a patient document on a, you know, secure server locally. He needs to access another state portal and then he needs to keep email and Skype open so that he can monitor for, you know, incoming things and all that. And he says, uh, it's a double whammy effect if I have to mess around with my main default setup to do this task and then reconstruct those previous windows afterwards. He says it becomes a cacophony of opening and closing windows. And of course, I would love these window locations to survive a reboot as well. He's, and, and then he goes on to say, if he happens to disconnect a monitor and plug it back in, then everything just blows up. He said, so. I'm wondering, is there a utility? He tried Switch Res X, but that wasn't quite doing it. And he says, is, is there another utility you know of that'll help me keep all of my window locations exactly where I want them and restore them when I want them, preferably across reboots automatically, but also uh, on demand? And the answer is yes. And anyone who is using multiple monitors, likely, it, even on a single monitor, to be perfectly honest, I mean, his use case... It, it perfectly describes this uh, for a single monitor as well, but, but certainly with multiple monitors where a simple disconnect uh, of a monitor just causes everything that you had over there set up pristinely to just barf all over your main screen. And then putting them back is like, like he said, this, you know, tedious thing and that's a pain in the neck. So yeah, there is a piece of software and it's called stay from cordlessdog.com, And it does exactly I mean, you couldn't have described a use case better. <laughs> um, and uh, and so stay is stay is it, man. Uh, and I use it like I I would probably have lost all of my sanity by now if, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an old man now, John. I, I, I just keep getting older. This happens every single year as you uh, mentioned yeah, at the but... beginning of the show. <clears throat> You're still under the threshold. I Okay. All right. There you go. I, I always hope to remain under the threshold, at least I'm, in spirit. I may be bad. Well, I think as long as we do this, right. we'll never lose our spirit. That's right. But um, but having this, especially, you know, when I said I was going through all those problems, like figuring out, like my monitor just wouldn't turn on. And the only way to, to, uh, to do it was, you know, to disconnect and re or reconnect power, power cycle, the thing. And uh, I mean, stay just like puts everything back where I want it. I don't, I don't have to think about it. I put it all there. I say, this is how I want my screen set up. And it's like, okay, good to go. And you can have different profiles and stuff. It's awesome. It's, it's awesome. Hopefully it always keeps working. And, uh, you know, I haven't, I honestly haven't tested that this with high Sierra yet, but, um, but we're, we're going to oh, just, right. um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, hmm. It's been December since it was updated. So, I I have a feeling it'll work. You know, let, let, we can talk a little bit about High Sierra because uh, there are some things, fundamental things that change with High Sierra. But in terms of use, like when you launch it, you're not going to notice a whole lot different. I don't think uh, it's it's basically an under the hood update, a major one. And there are some apps like that that won't run as if you're running an older app, like we run FileMaker here and uh, we've got one set of databases that's um, that's still on what I'll call the old 
format, which changed many years ago with FileMaker 12. So we're on FileMaker 11 with this one database. And that will change this week. We've got to we've got to jump that up to to current FileMaker, the, the, the 12 and later format to match all the other stuff that we do uh, because FileMaker 11 just doesn't run on High Sierra at all. I mean, it does, but it, it crashes a lot. And it's fine. I mean, it's, you know, it's like five years old or whatever. So that's okay. Six years old, I guess. But um, so there, there's going to be some of that stuff. But in terms of of what you'll see when you run things, uh, I don't, you know, I, I would guess that something like stay would, would probably work quite, quite fine on it. But there, there are under the hood things. And if you are running on an SSD, you've probably heard this, but, but we'll state it here too. When you upgrade to high Sierra, you will be upgraded to the new file system. You, it will very likely all, all the testing that we've done here has seen that happen without issue or fanfare. It works just fine. Uh, you often don't even know that it's happening uh, until afterwards. And you go to do a get info on the drive and it says, yeah, you're running APFS, which is pretty cool. The fact that they can do that, you know, right on top, we can, we can thank all of us iOS users for being the beta testers for that over the top upgrade, which is cool. So I don't know. There you go. What you, any thoughts on High Sierra to share with people as they're diving into their first week with it, John? No, none. I mean, I'm you've ready. you've run it. Um, any like, I mean, did you notice anything? Like, was there other than the file system stuff? You know, was there anything that just like jumped out at you? Not really. Yeah. Same. I looked at it and I'm like, well, looks the same. Mm -hmm. Seems to work the same. I mean, you'll notice, well, you know, I, there's some new features in photos and you know, yes. some of the apps have some incremental improvements, but nothing that blew me away because I don't think that's the intent of this release. This is to fix the plumbing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, rather than remodel the, uh, the, uh, the bathroom. <laughs> right. Right. It does. Yeah. <laughs> or, or whatever room. You, no, you that's good. Think up as your Mac. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so um, I have, I, and I mentioned this before, so I won't go too long on it, but I have found that on my on my older 2011 Air, which is sort of my test machine that I always try new OSs on and will and, until either I, you know, trade it out or OSs don't run on it anymore. And those two things will probably coincide. But um, that machine runs way faster with High Sierra than than it did with Sierra. And it's, it's, as I said, sort of the management of all the background processes that, that sort of run these days it happens much better with high Sierra. And I've heard others reporting this as well, but you mentioned photos and I do want to note that iOS 11 and high Sierra use a new um, photo compression codec and a, and a new video compression codec. And it's, it's called high efficiency video compression or high efficiency image compression. And it's, it's, they create files that are dot H E I C or dot H E I F for images and then dot H E V C or dot H E V F. So this replaces JPEG for the internal storage on your devices when you're when you go to share a photo from your iphone it converts it to jpeg on the fly and and off it goes but um these this format this heif format is um way smaller uh way more efficient i guess is the right way to say it hence the term high efficiency but it creates smaller files than jpeg for the same quality or greater quality at the same file size and, uh, and it is the standard for photos now. So you may see these things come up and uh, it's, you know, it's fine. It, you don't really have to worry about it. Just be aware of it in case you happen to run an app that's looking directly at your photos library, either on iOS or on, on High Sierra. And it, it's trying to like, if it's an older app and it just doesn't have support for HEIF, then that's bad. So there you go. Have you messed around with with anything, I mean, I know you've been using iOS 11, so sort of by default, you've been using HEIF, John, but have you, have you done anything? Uh, there's with... nothing that's impacted my workflow Got regarding it. HEIF, yeah. or as I like to think of it, the sound of a cat <clears throat> coughing up a hairball. There <laughs> you go. Yeah. Yeah. Heath. 
Yeah. <laughs> or heek. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I do like the new Safari, but we get that either in Sierra. You already have that if you updated this this week in Sierra to the new Safari um, where you get it. It's it's got all that pr- new private browsing stuff that the ad industry is up in arms about. And, you know, and I say this as a member of the ad industry, screw the rest of the ad industry. This is a really good thing. Tracking has actually ruined the ad industry. And I'm not, I'm, I'll stop my rant there. I think, you, I think my feelings on this are pretty clear. I think what Apple's doing is perfect. And I think the ad industry has to adapt and the last 12 years of disaster in the web ad industry perhaps is, is coming to an end and we can, we can do things the right way, but there you go. Um, so there's that. And then there's also, um, the, the, the video auto playing, which you get to have off by default and you can, tr- you can actually enable it on a per site basis. Um, I, I, I've actually know. found it breaks video playback in uh, some embedded uh-huh. players. Interesting. Okay. I mean, it doesn't autoplay, but the thing that I found is, uh, uh, I think it was uh, one thing on YouTube, but I, I tried to click to move the, the video forward into the, you know, the little bar. Yeah. Progress bar. And yeah. the click, it, it didn't register it. It's like, huh? Huh? Huh. That makes I'm sense. Like, I want to jump ahead. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if I got to get a. I don't know if the. Yeah, I guess the people that make these things may have to tweak them. Cool. Yeah. So I mean, there there are definitely some things that are new, but it's not like you know it's going to look extremely familiar to you uh, when you run this. Yeah. So. I like the ad thing though, because one thing that's always annoyed me is you know especially it's like stop following me. Yeah. It's like every oh, yeah. site you go to shows you the thing that you, you saw on Amazon that you didn't buy. And it's like, stop bugging me. Yes, yeah, stop it. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. All right. Um, let's see. Where are we here? I can't even see the time anymore because I've got Safari in the way. I have too many Sebastian. Safari windows. Open. Speaking of yeah, go ahead. Yeah, perfect. Take us to Sebastian, please. I want to take you to Sebastian because I had I ran into this and it's a big pain in the neck and I don't know why this is the case. But uh, okay. I'm assuming this is the case in his case, in which case. Uh, Sebastian says, I've downloaded and tried to install a printer driver for a Rico SP-410DN. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm currently unable to access main printer features such as two-sided changing the paper type and every option is generic. How do I reinstall the Rico SP 410 DN to access all of the native printing features? I also have a bunch of presets on another older computer. How do I get these settings to my new computer? So I do not have to try to remember all the presets. I hope this is a question because if it's not, I don't know where to go with this because I ran into this exact same problem. So okay. you may know, I recently had my decade old HP inkjet just die on me or it said the printhead is bad. And it's like, I just changed an ink cartridge. Why, why, why did that break the printhead? But it did. Right. So, <laughs> could be, it could be using that knockoff ink finally caught up with me. So I got a Canon IX 6820. Okay. Light years ahead in every respect. Um, and one thing, but one thing I ran into was setting it up. And what happened is you, you know, you go to the system preferences, printers, uh, you add a printer and then you get a dialogue and, and it'll show you the candidates that are available. And so one, it should appear, but I found that if you take the wrong path, Dave, terrible things like this can happen. And the path that I did take was that I clicked on the name of the printer and the kind was Bonjour. I, I don't think that mattered. And then you get a couple of choices, what to name it, its location. Okay. And then there's a use menu. And at least in my case, it defaulted to air print, which is kind of cool, but here's the problem. The air print driver, the other option is the printer itself. Right. So it lists right, air print right. or Canon IX6800 series. The first time I set it up, I chose air print. And then I ran into a similar issue is that one of the reasons I got this printer was that it prints the 13 by 19 paper. So, you know, I went into photos, took uh, one of my 
masterpieces and uh, wanted to print it out. And then I go to the select the paper size and I'm like, well, it's 13 by 19. It's not there. And it wasn't there. <laughs> it made me sad. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And I finally went to the Canon support board and someone suggested this and they're like, oh yeah, by the way, um, explicitly select the Canon driver again <laughs> when you're setting it up and then you'll get all the features. Oh, so even though you had installed the Canon driver, when you added the printer a second time, it went and chose the built-in Mac OS driver, not the, when I, not the one. Is that right? When I installed it, in the, when I made the operating system aware of it yeah. by, through the printer's uh, right, right. dialogue, I made the wrong choice is what happened. Got it. Okay. Yeah, no, that's good to know. Right. It, it It's great that- And it defaulted to it, which bothers me because yeah. it defaults to a choice that may not give the user the full capabilities of- their product. I don't know why it does this if it's Canon specific, but it sounds like it's no, not. No, because it's not. I'm this almost is... certain this is what happened to Sebastian is that it probably defaulted to. Well, you, I mean, you, you just, it, this is an Apple product, John. I, the, I mean, Mac <laughs> OS is no, I, I don't say this to be snarky, although I mean, I realize I'm being snarky, but Apple prioritizes clean, reliable, consistent, user experience over all the features that, you know, all, all the tweaks and nuances that, that you or I, or anybody listening to the show might want. Right. So when you add a printer, their goal is to give you a printer that works right. And a driver that works and that they know works and doesn't have a lot of cruft in it. So, uh, but it means that it's going to be missing features almost by definition, right? But that's why you can, if you're willing to go out and download the driver and know that that's an option and you put, want to put it in there and choose it, then by all means, you get all the features. And if something, if the vendor does something a little wonky because, you know, that happens all the time, then, or you upgrade to High Sierra and suddenly Canon's driver doesn't work because they haven't updated for High Sierra and there's some feature, you know, that we don't know about, that they don't know about, that breaks it. Well, okay, but you're using a third-party driver. If you use Apple's driver, which really is usually, originally at least, written by the third party and then sort of certified by Apple, um, then that will work with High Sierra, right? I mean, like, that's, this is part of the Apple experience that we have to... A, buy into, but also B, find our ways around. And it's why we do the show. So I get it. I, it's like, like I said, it's not my favorite thing. I always choose the third party drivers for the printers that I have, but I, you know, well, yeah, because you yeah. want to get all I, I, the most yeah. bang for your buck. You and pay I'm, for all these I'm, features. Right. And I'm willing to deal with, you know, a quirky thing here or there if it happens. So there you go. Yeah. 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 I wasn't. I actually tried, I got real close is that I actually created a custom paper size, okay. but it wouldn't print borderless. It almost got me to the point of being able to, to uh, print on a 13 by 19. Okay. But there was still a border and that just drives me mad. Well, some printers like have to have a border for the rollers to roll along. I mean, you can't print yeah. edge to edge. This one doesn't. Printers. This one has the capability to do borderless. Oh, it's yeah. just when I put it in a frame, I don't want yeah, yeah. to see a border. Right. That's just well, me. That. And then and then the second question, this one's pretty straightforward. Yep. Your presets, where are they at? <laughs> I'll tell you where they're at. Home, library, preferences. And then you're going to see a file with naming kind of like this, com.apple.print.custompresets.4printer, F-O-R, printer, dot something. <laughs> And that's indeterminate because in my case, I saw two things. So one is I saw the name of my inkjet printer, Canon, whatever. But then I saw another entry on my computer and it was the IP address of my laser printer. So it could be anything, but you should be able to figure it out. So that's where that stuff right. is stored. So you should be able to just copy that and paste it to the new environment and... Uh, good to go. Yeah. Should be good to go. Yeah. The, they did change the naming convention versus, you know, I started doing some research and they're like, oh yeah, it's here and here's the name of it. Um, but what I found didn't have the four printer thing. So. Right. Right. Cool. 
Uh, all right, let's change gears a little bit here. We've still got a little bit of time. Uh, Michael on Facebook brings up his question brings up a, a thing that, you know, like everything, we're always looking for what's the what's the nugget of, of information here and uh, what's the shareable tidbit. So Michael says one thought on the lack of iOS app store in iTunes for the Mac. This is not going where you think it is. Trust me, if you're sick and tired of hearing iTunes rants, I'm with you. I'll get there. There's a tip. He says, today I was using an app and thought I would go to the app store to review it. As I usually do, I write my app store reviews in a text editor and then copy it and paste it into iTunes. I started, then remembered that I cannot do that. So I gave up. I hate, 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 he says, writing reviews on my iPhone. It's too small and I make too many typos. So I simply will not write app reviews anymore. He says, if anyone is like me, this lack of, uh, yeah. Okay, so we get you, we hear you, but- Here's a trick that you can do to ex start it exactly the way that you did prior. Go to your Mac, go into whatever your te favorite text editor is and write your review. And then do the second step. Copy that review to your clipboard. Assuming you are using a Mac and an iOS device that are current enough to support uh, clipboard sharing or whatever that handoff feature is officially called. Now go into your on your phone and go to say, I want to write a review and put your text field in the, you know, get yourself to where the text field is, is ready for you to type the review. And instead of typing tap and pull up paste. And when you hit paste, the clipboard from your Mac will be pasted into that field. And I always forget about this, that you can do this shared clipboard thing. And it's awesome. It's great when I have to do, like, uh, I mean, sometimes I wind up doing it with passwords or, you know, different things where it's like, yeah, I just want to, I, I need this data from here, there, and I don't want to have to retype it. I can see it on my screen on my Mac. So I copy it and then paste and, and you'll see it. Like there's a little bit of a lag when it, it says, oh, you want me to get the clipboard from your Mac? Great. And it just sort of does that. So, yep, it is that to me, that's the way to do it. And, um, and it's great. I, I use the feature all the time, but, uh, but it's easy to forget that it's there if you're not using it all the time. So it's a good question, Michael. And I'm sorry you're unhappy about iTunes 12, seven. I, I don't think it matters whether we're happy or unhappy. Like I said before, this is just, this is the new normal. Here we go. Yeah. 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 Um, Oh, we'll jump around. It's my birthday, John. So I'm going to, I'm going to do uh, this question from Dan. If you, if you don't mind, uh, we talked about capo before. So any musicians listening to this show, here's another one, but, but again, this, you know, goes in a different direction than, than you might think initially. Listener Dan on Facebook asks, I'm learning bass guitar. He says, and seeing as I've got an iPhone seven, I have caused to use the supplied dongle to plug my phone's audio out, my headphones audio out into my practice amp. The thing is the quality is awful. And I realized that there must be a tiny little DAC in the dongle. If I've understood that correctly is the only way to get better audio to buy a third party DAC of some sort. Yeah. Uh, so you're right that the um, that the dongle has a DAC in it. And by DAC, we mean digital to analog converter. Uh, you this used to exist inside the iPhone and still does because you have to convert sound to analog in order to put it out the speakers that are in the iPhone. But out the lightning port, you don't get analog, you get digital. And so Apple has they built a little uh, a little DAC uh, into that to convert the digital signal to analog and the quality of your DAC will make a huge difference, uh, to how things are going to work and how things are going to sound. Um, I'm going to set Dan's specifics aside for a moment, uh, but we'll come back to it. Uh, in a general sense, Apple's DAC isn't bad. Uh, there's a reason it's not working with your bass amp and I have, uh, that's what we'll come back to. But if you want much higher quality headphone output, you can get uh, a, a DAC that will work with it. Now, um, there are many USB powered third party DACs that you can buy. I use on my computer down in the office, I use an audio engine D1 
and it sounds freaking amazing. I like, I don't, I didn't think it would make that much of a difference moving my speakers from the audio out jack on my iMac to the audio out jack on this, you know, tiny little, little box that I connected to my Mac with USB. It, it, it makes all the difference in the world. Like music sounds deeper, richer, wider. It, it like, it, it's a remarkable difference. I really didn't expect it. And I, I've kind of raved about this before in the past. So if you want to step up the game of the audio quality coming out of your Mac, just from a pure listening standpoint, it, it, you can, you can do that. Uh, now the audio engine D one has a USB B port on it. So it's like that, 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 uh, you know, sort of house shaped port square thing that you find on a lot of printers. So you'd have to get a lightning to USB B cable to see if the iPhone could power that DAC and then, and then use it. Cause it's just USB powered. I don't know if it can or not. Right. But that, if you, you know, to test that, that's what you need to do. Um, Onkyo makes a, a DAC that they call the HA 200 that has a USB a port and it says it works with lightning. So that one uh, would, would be one to get. And of course, uh, I mean, I'm sure it comes, well, I don't know if it comes with the lightning to USB a cable. You'd have to look at the packaging details, but the, you charge your iPhone with a lightning to USB a cable all the time. So you have that cable. Um, so that would be another one. And then uh, I know audio quest has a lot of lightning things and they have their beetle DAC, uh, which would require a lightning to micro USB cable might work again. I, I don't have it to test, but um, audio quest. I, I know people have spoken. I've never tested their DACs. I actually like to, but um, I've, uh, I don't, I don't know if there's as powerful over lightning, but, but there you go. Any thoughts on this before I, I wrap up by just a answering Dan's quick thing about, about what'll make his base work better, John. Nope. Okay. All right. Um, so the thing with your base is you're taking headphone output and running it into your amplifier. So you're taking amplified output. It headphone output is not line level output. Uh, it is built to like, there is such a thing as a headphone amplifier and that is happening in that process. Uh, and that can, that can be the problem with why things sound like crap coming out of your amp. Uh, turn the volume way down on your iPhone. You, you might be able to make things work even with the current little dongle that you have. Uh, but they make uh, little things that will plug into your lightning port. And I'm 99% certain I'm looking here uh, that IK Multimedia's iRig, I think they have the iRig lightning, right? Well, I mean, why am I not finding this on their website? But um, maybe it's the iRig Pro. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Uh, uh, I'll put a link in the show notes, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the iRig Pro. That's what you would want. And uh, and then you can plug um, from that. I think that'll go out. Or is that only in? Huh. I thought it was going the other way, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe that's why I'm thinking of the wrong thing. It, you would, you, your issue is gain. You're, you're sending too much gain out to your amp. Um, and so that, that you just need to get that to turn down. So you need to go lightning to, to, to line level and not headphone output, which is different. That's the issue. I'll find something. I, 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 as we prep the show, I'm like, oh, the iRig's the thing. And then I remembered as obviously as we're talking here that the iRig is really meant for input. So uh, I'm not sure that that's the right thing, but we'll get you something, Dan. We'll figure it out. I'll post on that Facebook post and we'll follow up with that. Any thoughts on that, John? Don't amplify an amplified signal. Well, right. Yeah. Or an overmodulated signal. Well, it'll, it'll, you will get over modulation if you if you keep amplifying something over and over again in, in different stages of the gain structure. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I like it. All right, man. Well, I think that gets us there. Right. I think it's time to bring the band. There. In. Right. right. There or here. Um, no, there. Well, or back everywhere. there. Yeah. Here, there, everywhere. Oh, I don't know, man. It's crazy. 
It's crazy what happens in this world. Uh, I want to make sure we thank our premium subscribers. MattGeekUp.com slash premium is where you can go. Those of you that are, I, I, we mentioned it last week, but those of you that are on uh, credit card billing will very likely be getting an email this week about shifting over to the new system. We've been testing it with some of you. If any of you want to volunteer to test before we ask you, uh, please just reach out to us. Premium at MacGeekab.com is, of course, the email address that you get to use when you are a premium supporter. And that's a good one to get in touch with us with. Uh, this week, we had contributions come in from Micah P., Santiago M., Stephen A., John V., John D., Todd Z., Luann D., Giles C, Craig R, George M, Graham M, William P, Daniel H, and Royce T. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You all rock. It really means a lot to us. And I and I'm I'm going to apologize again for having to ask you to migrate manually to a new system. But uh, but it's the only way we can do it without these people uh, essentially trying to steal a bunch of money from us. So I know they're not really stealing. They're just doing their thing, but it's an antiquated business model that they're hanging on to, and they don't like it. So we're moving past them. Moving into the future is what we're doing. So there you go. Uh, we mentioned how premium listeners can get in touch with us, but uh, everybody is welcome to use the feedback at MacGeekab.com address. Did you say the feedback at MacGeekab.com address? Oh, I did. I said the feedback at MacGeekab.com address. And also, everybody is welcome to use our phone number, where you can leave us a voicemail or send us a text message, 224-888-GEEK, which, John, is? 4335. As far as you know that it is, John. That's right. And uh, I want to make sure we thank everybody. We want to thank all of you for listening. We want to thank... Uh, Cashfly for providing all the bandwidth C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com We want to thank our sponsors Of course Stamps.com You go there You click on the little radio thing You put in MGG And you get uh, It's like 110 bucks worth of all sorts of freebies Which is just awesome uh, Included with your With your, your trial And uh, You get Great stuff from our friends at Otherworld Computing at MaxSales.com. You can get BB at it from our folks at BareBones.com. Smile at SmileSoftware.com. I hope you all have a splendid week. Enjoy High Sierra. Let us know if you have any questions, tips, or problems about that, of course. And, uh, you know, don't get caught. Made up.